Reliance upon modeling has become quite commonplace within the domain of scientific methodology for designating all representations or reproductions that serve to further the state of knowledge. The model in its reduced and workable scale is able to reproduce the properties of a full-sized object and thus be submitted to a series of measurements, computations and physical testing that would prove difficult on more cumbersome elements. As of the 19th century, the hulls of sailing vessels were being sized on the basis of reduced scale models. At the present time, wind tunnel tests are conducted on large sized aeroelastic models. Wave action and sedimentation, as well as large dam projects and port facility design, are often verified by means of reduced scale models. Research and studies on the behavior of geotechnical structures provide critical sizing indications. The structural sizing step is performed by virtue of empirical methods and analytical numerical computations in making use of the rheological properties of geomaterials. Validation of computational results can then be carried out on full-scale structures either within specific testing facilities or in situ. This approach, which does not readily lend itself to test repeatability or parametric investigations, requires highly adapted and costly instrumentation. Certain geotechnical specialists have thereby been showing greater interest in reduced scale models to help better analyze the interaction phenomena occurring between geomaterials and civil engineering structures. One method currently receiving considerable attention is physical centrifuge modeling. In order to develop an overview of soil rheology, a series of triaxial rotational tests would, for example, be feasible. In this case, the sample is submitted to both a radial and axial mechanical loading. This setup pertains to a specific type of reduced scale model assumed to represent a point in the soil mass. In mechanics of continuous media, such an approach enables deriving the constitutive law. Geomaterials typically display a behavior that is both highly nonlinear and dependent upon the stress state. The plasticity criterion serving to delimit the zone separating elastic from plastic behavior depends on the combination of primary stresses. Within a given soil mass, the three primary stresses are often oriented in two horizontal directions and one vertical direction. The vertical stress due to dead weight is equal to the product of mass density multiplied by both gravitational acceleration and depth z. Between two distinct depths, the difference in stress is thus delta sigma v. When this difference proves significant with respect to the intensity of stresses acting in the mass portion, in particular adjacent to the soil's surface, it then becomes necessary to model the soil mass forces, such as the case with shallow tunnels. The similarity between the prototype geotechnical structure and the reduced scale model is characterized by invariance in the a-dimensional ratio between certain orders of magnitude. One example would be the in scale factor for lengths. For the vertical stress to be identical at two corresponding points, the scale factor on the rho g product must equal n. Since the density range for natural materials is not very extensive, density is maintained at the same level while increasing the gravitational constant. The model must therefore be submitted to a macrogravity field in order to establish a similitude relationship with the prototype. 
This step involves the combination of three out of seven basic units, time, length, and mass. The term macrogravity is employed whenever gravitational acceleration surpasses the Earth's gravitation. This acceleration is deduced from Newton's law of universal attraction established in 1683. The areas where natural macrogravity exert an influence are not easily accessible. On the Sun, the gravitational field is 28 times higher than on Earth, yet metrological problems would still need to be taken into account. The most basic similitude conditions may be obtained by examining the indefinite equations in mechanics, which include Cauchy stress, the coordinate system, mass density, components of the gravitational acceleration fields, and particle acceleration obtained as the derivative of speed. When a fluid flows within a medium featuring regularly connected porosity, a volumic force oriented in the flow direction is superimposed on the effective stress gradient recovered by the solid skeleton and becomes the volumic force of percolation. This particular technique, developed during the 1960s, is referred to as the hydraulic gradient technique. In this manner, it's possible to simulate the 50G level. The base friction table enables generating a force by means of friction from a conveyor belt on a model for studying either the stability of rock masses or shallow tunnel sections. The hydraulic gradient and base friction table methods do not simulate the actual macrogravity, but rather its effects. In order to create a gravitational constant increment by modifying model acceleration, it would be necessary to place the model in motion. Cassagrande's assay test, which serves to determine the liquidity limit, makes use of the rise in inertial forces. An embankment rupture using a highly reduced scale model is caused by a succession of shocks. The most widespread technique consists of centrifuging the model at constant speed. Acceleration intensity is set equal to the product of the radius and the square of angular speed. Depending on the selected modeling approach, the stress profile differs as a function of depth. Both the hydraulic gradient and the base friction table methods generate a constant stress gradient, rho g, identical to that present in a homogeneous natural mass. Devices such as the calibration chamber or the triaxial test impose a zero stress gradient and reproduce a set of loading conditions which remain valid over a small section of the mass. In the centrifuge, the stress gradient varies linearly with depth. It was in 1869 that Edouard Philippe introduced the physical modeling principle on a reduced scale centrifuge model. With a keen sense of structural analysis, Philippe thereby established the basic rules of similitude. The first centrifuges designed for the field of geotechnical engineering date back to the 1930s. In the United States, Bucky studied the stability of mine shaft roofs, while in the Soviet Union, Potkrovsky was focusing on the stability of earthen structures. And for myself, I first came across the concept of centrifuge testing when I had Sokolovsky's book, Staticus Sopuzis, the Statics of Grand Media Translated and I found a footnote which mentioned Pekrovsky's well-known method of centrifuge modeling. So for me, in 1956, that was the first time I began to think of centrifuge method. And I began to research it, but I found the Russian literature dried up. There were no publications. So, I assumed that there was a mistake, that there is some error. Perhaps there is an error of Coriolis effect, or some material error, I didn't know. So as I began to work 
in Cambridge after 1956. In 1957, at the London Conference, Sokolovsky was able to come and I met him in London. But by the 1970s, the Cold War had become very confrontational and weapons effects were very much on people's mind, the bomb, the big bomb. And I realized in the visit to Moscow why it was that the Soviets had not published a lot. It turned out that the centrifuge was an excellent way of testing the weapons effects of big bombs on buried structures. Two families of centrifuges can be distinguished, both of which rotate without exception in a horizontal plane. In the so-called drum centrifuges, of less widespread application, the model is built inside a cylinder. On the other hand, in the so-called beam centrifuges, the model is placed within a vessel attached to the end of the arm. Among the 60 or so geotechnical centrifuges in operation in the world, some 15 have been developed along the lines of the model built at the Laboratoire Central des Ponts et Chaussées. The large radius centrifuges, about 20 of which feature a radius exceeding 3 meters, enable applying more homogeneous acceleration to the model than the small radius centrifuges. The centrifuge-loaded soil masses are primarily composed of sand or clay. Testing on a reduced-scale centrifuge model begins once the necessary level of macrogravity has been reached. The advent of robots, such as that produced by the Laboratoire Central des Ponts et Chaussées, coupled with the continual release of new equipment, has enabled expanding and varying the types of centrifuge tests to better grasp complex problems, such as the installation of foundations or the phasing of earthwork and foundation support work. A vibrating table may also be loaded onto the centrifuge in order to simulate an earthquake. All actions introduced on the model are performed remotely during the testing phase. Data acquisition is typically carried out in the control room. The setup allows recording the forces, pressures, displacements and deformations along with the measurements provided by specific sensors. In order to validate similitude relations, an initial method consists of comparing centrifuge test results with in situ results. The second method calls for conducting centrifuge testing on reduced scale models at a number of different scales. By submitting each model to the appropriate acceleration, the results with respect to prototype structure are expected to overlap, provided the modeling approach has been correctly adapted. These results may also be compared with those stemming from computations deduced using a numerical model. And the main applications pertain to structural supports, underground structures, soil dynamics, and environmental geotechnics. Beyond the field of geotechnical engineering, the use of macrogravity has also enabled making progress in the fields of granular media, crystalline growth, combustion, and plate tectonics. From this perspective, macrogravity can be complementary with studies carried out using microgravity. In 1981, creation of the International Technical Committee on Centrifuge Testing meant official recognition by the geotechnical community of the true value of this experimental technique, the novelty of which has worn off, especially by contributing to the regulations issued on foundation sizing. The specificity of each major structure is reproduced in a quasi-prototype with no previous model available, providing a basis for predicting its behavior. In examining the major structures currently under construction, it's clear that they're getting even bolder and often rely upon innovative concepts. Confronted with this situation, the engineer has two tools to choose from in sizing and designing the required structure. First, numerical modeling, the standard tool for all 
practitioners, and second, physical modeling for testing the validity of these newly introduced concepts. Numerical modeling is merely the transcription in mathematical terms of an idealized approach to the particular structure. Physical modeling serves as a complement in its capacity not only to validate the models, but also to visualize structural behavior, notably under extreme situations such as failure loadings, for which numerical modeling is most certainly less effective. The physical-numerical modeling couple therefore makes it possible to derive a relatively reliable approach to structural composition. Here, the challenge is an infrastructure that connects the Peloponnesus to the continent under extremely adverse environmental conditions given a depth of 65 meters midway across the strait. The foundation soils are quaternary alluvial deposits of mediocre quality with thicknesses exceeding 500 meters. Moreover, a high seismic risk had been identified for the entire region, magnitude 7, with maximum accelerations of 0.5 g at ground level. The structure was intended to adapt to significant tectonic movements reflected by two-meter offsets between two consecutive supports, either vertically or horizontally. The foundation laying principle represents a breakthrough innovation, at least for construction in a seismic zone, as a result of using 90-meter diameter gravitational caissons that lie directly on the sea floor, with the ground having previously been reinforced by means of rigid inclusions. The rigid inclusions are actually tubes, two meters in diameter, 20 millimeters thick and 25 to 30 meters long, driven by a mesh of approximately seven meters by seven meters underneath each foundation, which leads to roughly between 150 and 200 inclusions under each one of the supports. On top of these inclusions, a layer of gravel acts like a fuse. This entire layout, gravel plus rigid inclusions, serves both to control the foundation failure mode in the case of an exceptional event and to limit the forces transmitted to the superstructure. While the gravel serves as a fuse, ground reinforcement enables avoiding the formation of deep rupture surfaces, which would induce sizable rotational movements on a 230-meter high tower. Testing enabled not only validating the concept, but also convincing the Structural Inspection Office responsible for verification to develop and then validate computational tools for sizing the actual structure. The field of environmental geotechnics allows for a very broad range of investigation on problems both man-made, soil pollution, stability of earthen structures, and of natural origin, earthquakes, or wintertime stability of hillside slopes. The results obtained on reduced-scale instrumental models have contributed to furthering the state of knowledge on the mechanics of geotechnical structures. The use of physical centrifuge modeling techniques is really only limited by the imagination shown by the researchers and engineers making use of such equipment.